Hi, this is Brother Richard. And today we're continuing with our lesson series. Going to talk is mystery part four ten. We're continuing with our lesson titled The Vision of Authority, Part Three. Now, <clears throat> the scripture teaches that God does not look on the outer, he looks on the inner part of man. The question arises, why is that? What is it that motivates him to look on the inner part of man's being rather than the outer part of man's being? Well, primarily because God is addressing the true being that's wearing the physical body. Scripture indicates several classes of spirits are incarnated into the human race. Not all are the same class of spirit. <clears throat> Among them, we're going to take a look at three. Among them are the pure Adamic spirit, which was created to be a custodian of the earth. Genesis, the first chapter, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So we find here that what's being created is not the physical part of man, it's the spiritual part. Amen. It is a race of beings called Adam. They are not physical. Turn to Genesis, second chapter. Verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. <clears throat> the difference between Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.7 is that in Genesis 1.27 he becomes man. In Genesis 2, 7, he becomes a living, breathing being, physical, human. Yes. I understood that we use the word nephish for man in Genesis 2, 7. Yes. Meaning the living soul, the living being. Yes. What word do we use for man in Genesis 1, 26? Um, spirit, ruach. Ruach, okay. So ruach and nephish. Yes. Nephish meaning flesh. Yes. Okay. Yes. You see the difference here. When you look at Genesis 1, 26 and 27, it never indicates anything physical. Hmm. In Genesis 1, 7, it's totally physical. He's made of the dust, the A4. Mm -hmm. He's breathing. No allusion to that in Genesis, the first chapter. But the language, and of course this is purely because it's been translated into English, uh, Genesis 2-7, became a living soul. Well, he's a living soul in Genesis 1-27. No, he's the spirit in Genesis 1-27. Okay, so the you living not, part you, you refers to flesh. Yeah. Okay. Soul refers to the compound <clears throat> being, because it uses the word breathing. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Meaning, he's talking about flesh at that point. Yes. He's talking about the thing that animates man. Man is a physical being taken from the soil <clears throat> and then animated by the breath that's put within him and he becomes a breathing. The scripture is illustrating he became something he was not before. Right. 
But man well, becomes uh, so and so. Soul, right. So the understanding is that the soul aspect of Genesis 2 7 is part of the flesh being and not part of the spirit ru ruach. Uh, no, but what it's referring to is not in the sense of spiritual. Okay. It's, it's pronounced soul, mm -hmm. but it's referring to a physical being. In Genesis, the first chapter, it's all confined, uh, confined to the spiritual aspect. He becomes man in Genesis 1, 27. He becomes a soul, a nephesh, in Genesis 2, 7. So you can see a transition sure. that's being spoken of here. Yes. If man became, or became man in 127, mm -hmm. what was he before he became man? Nothing. It didn't exist. In other words, he was a temporal spirit created at that point. Yeah, he Nothing comes into existence in Genesis right. 127. Right. The scripture in 26 says, let us make man. Sure. And he creates him. Well, if he creates him, it means that he didn't exist before he was created. Sure. <clears throat> In Genesis, the second chapter, he's not created, he's formed. Yatsar. Mm. Two different words connoting two different operations. So going back to our principle, mm. where you've invoked the incarnation into the human race, we should understand that of the three, because you mentioned three, and I'm sure uh, you're going to say two of them are eternal and therefore pre-Adamic, which is you know, the point that he's making, and one of them, which is the point he's making, is Adamic and starts and exists purely at that point. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> the human race is a uh, basically a basis for which spirits are incarnating from different places in the creation. Yes. Okay. I meant to ask this last time we had a Bible study, but okay, I'll ask it right now. Mm -hmm. Brother Jones, whenever the Father is giving a, a synopsis of, of, a, of a particular thing that's happened, mm -hmm. he speaks about the heart of man. Mm -hmm. Now we know that the man <coughs> makes his decisions using his brain. Mm -hmm. Heart is in the place of where I would have put brain. Explain that, please. Well, the heart has nothing to do with the physical. The heart is the inner makeup of man, the inner being. It's not referring to your physical heart that beats. It's referring to what you initially are. The heart of man is deceitful, uh, wicked. Mm. It's referring to a nature, a characteristic of a okay. being. A spiritual characteristic. Yes. Mm. Now, Genesis 3, Genesis 3, verse... 19. <clears throat> Further gives illumination about physical man. It says, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou returnest unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Adoma thou art, clay thou art, and unto clay shall thou... He's referring to the tripartite makeup of this being. Nowhere do you find the illusion in Genesis, the first chapter. In Genesis, the first chapter, is a unity spoken into existence, a compound unit meant to live eternally. Yes. He's giving man a covering. Well, basically the inference is that he's speaking to a temporary creation. Okay, so the whole, his whole premise is this is for now, not forever. 
Yes. Okay. I gotta. I gotta keep that. Go ahead. But, but is the flesh of Genesis two seven a covering, as we would understand it from a heavenly perspective? Uh, in a sense, but that's not what it's meant to be. What it's meant to be is an ability to exist in a different environment. Reality, okay. So it's because of he's in now a different reality. Yeah, he had to construct a, a, a compo component so that the spirit being could function in this environment. Yes. Okay, so as, as we're going along, I'm, I'm starting to pick up bits and pieces and I'm changing my understanding of what I understand here. Mm -hmm. I would think he is bringing forth man to till the soil. He's given a purpose, but in the back of his mind, he's saying, well, it's a purpose for now. I'm going to change it later? Is that is that what he's thinking? No. Because no. Wh where I want to go with this, where I want to speak out, Mr. Jones, and then you're going to correct me, mm -hmm. is that I'm thinking, okay, this is man. Elohim is is watching what this guy's doing. He's doing as, as much as he can to not make man permanent of any any sort, reliable mm -hmm. or anything. Mm -hmm. He's given him a temporary existence, temporary covering, AFAR, the cheapness, he's in abundance. Mm -hmm. he, there's not, no consideration of length of time. It's all intentionally temporary. Yes, and we're it never just, meant to be permanent. Never. That's why he says, Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. He's telling him about the temporary state that he's in. How long can, would you guess that he's thinking that man is going to be doing this job before he's going to change it again? Uh, well, man basically was meant to endure maybe a thousand years, okay. a little more. All right. All right. Yeah. And in that respect, um, because there is no temporary existence at that point, right, Mr. No. Jones? Yeah. No. So, that, so he's not doing it because I've done it like this so many times. Yeah. Now I'm going to give you a scripture that shows that Adamic man is a vehicle for spirits from different parts of the creation. Turn to Genesis. 25. Starting in verse 21, we're going to read down to verse 23. Isaac, verse 21, And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So YHVH enabled her to get pregnant. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. You have two different spirit groups that are gaining entrance into the human race through this woman. Oh, I see. So one being serpent seed and the other Adamic. <coughs> Mr. Yes. Jones. Yes. Okay. He is doing this as if it's been a well thought through situation. Okay, there's going to be two nations in you. One's going to be stronger, one's going to be weaker. It's as if he has done something like he's used to doing this kind of thing. Uh, no. This isn't um, YHVH. This is a spirit telling her 
what she's going through. Why is VH enabled her to get pregnant, but he didn't take into consideration the results of what's going to happen here. The woman doesn't know what's going on. There's some struggling going on within her. She goes to an individual that has access to the spirit of wisdom and knowledge. And that spirit tells her, two nations are in your womb. This and this and this is going to happen. Okay. I'm illustrating a principle here. The, the human race, the Adamic race, is composed of different spiritual groups from different parts of the, within and without the creation. Excuse me. Thanks. Yes. In verse 22, we see that she went to inquire of the Lord. Yes. Are we understanding yes. that she inquired through somebody else of the Lord? Yes. Who's the other, who's that, who's that person? Well, somebody who has the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Okay, like an, old, an elder lady or something. Yeah. All right. Uh -huh. There were people there in Israel that, just like you have in the body of Christ, you have mm -hmm. people that, uh, you have uh, um, <clears throat> basically discernment of spirits. Okay. There you had basically the same thing. Is it a soothsayer? No. No. That's a witch. No. It's probably a prophetess who uh, can give, like um, um, uh, Abigail, I think it was David's wife or something like that, okay. who could divine understanding things spiritually and advise people. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go on. I'm just using this to illustrate a point. The human race is not unitarianly cohesive. That's why the scripture tells us God looks at the inner being. He's dealing with the spirit of the individual because that's going to be what happens, what, how he deals with the individual. He will deal with Esau differently than he will deal with Jacob. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Why? Because of the spiritual makeup of the individual. Why? <clears throat> because each spirit has a different history. Each spiritual group has a different history. <clears throat> and it takes that history into the human race with it. We're going to see uh, as this develops. Scripture teaches another class, a spirit within the Adamic race, is the fallen tear spirit, which is an ancient race which dwelt with Lucifer, came under Lucifer's influence before the creation of the Adamic race. Ezekiel 31, verse 6. fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs. Under his branches did all the beasts of the earth bring forth their young. Under his shadow dwell all great nations. <coughs> this is referring to Lucifer when he reigned as vice regent over the secondary creation before its fall. He influenced all nations, all the intelligences of the secondary creation. Get him under his influence. So, should we understand that <coughs> tear spirits come from any number of tear spiritual nations? Yes. Yes. Not, not a specific family or race, but <coughs> any number of them. No, they can come from different aspects of the fallen creation. Jesus dealt with this. So, under the Gospel of John, 8th chapter. Mr. Jones, let me ask you a question here. Yes. So, I'm reminded of the way, what you just now said, it's like the same thing we have here in America. These migrants are coming from everywhere, all, the whole world, and they're just swarming in, and they're taking over our rights, our, our, the money that's you know, made for us, 
Mm -hmm. And I see, well, where, where does it stop in the heavens? Where, where, you know, where, well, it's confined heaven? in the heavens by uh, fiat, by authority. Remember, you have beings like uh, the Watchers, the Holy Ones, the Dawn Star hierarchy, they're, they're not going to allow it to run rampant like it is on Earth because Earth is under the tutelage of Lucifer. But, turn to John, the 8th chapter. And we're going to start with verse 38 down to verse <coughs> 44. <coughs> I speak that which I have seen with my Father. Let's talk about the Heavenly Father. And ye do that which ye have seen with your Father. What is he talking about? He's talking about the time of the Luciferian reign <coughs> where Lucifer influenced all the nations. Well, they were watching what he was doing. He was inculcating them, corrupting them, directing them in the ways of rebellion, in the ways of sin, in the ways of the, everything contrary to God. <coughs> then he goes on. They answered and said unto them, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, Ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot, cannot hear my word. Why? Because they have been influenced by Lucifer to reject the counsel of God. Automatically rejected. The only way they would receive it if they willed to neutralize their programming to receive what he has to say. And they weren't about to do that. Then he goes on. Ye of, are of your father the devil. So he comes right out and says it. Ye are of your father the devil. And the loss of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Tares abide in lies. They detest the truth because they are not of the truth. They've been programmed to incarnate into the human race to sow discard, to sow destruction upon the Adamic race. Turn back to Genesis, third chapter. Verse 15. And I will put enmity, animosity, hatred, strife between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. So here it's referring to, of course, the ultimate prototokos conflict that will take place. But pre preceding that, you're going to have incarnate into the human race spirits whose total purpose is to wreak destruction and chaos upon mankind. Mm -hmm. That's their total purpose. You just read it. 
you hate me, you hate those that are of the truth because you are not of the truth. You are programmed to follow the deeds of your father, the devil. He's talking, couldn't get to make it more plainer. You're looking at two different groups of spirits incarnate in the human race. And currently, the human race is under the dominion of the tares, the bloodlines, the rich families, the rulers. They don't rule in behalf of the people. They rule in behalf of themselves at the expense of the people. The coming election is going to be the crown example of that. They're not going to want to acquiesce to the will of the people if Trump gets elected. They're not going to acquiesce to the rules of law. They are going to upend everything through violence, chaos, and overall naked aggression force. But let's go on. So we see two groups here. The pure Adamic spirit which incarnates becomes human. The fallen tear spirit which incarnates becomes human. And we see another group. Scripture teaches yet another group are the prototokis spirits called to be inheritors in Christ of all things from eternity. Romans 8 verses 15 to 17. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. For the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. I'm going to repeat that. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God. Now, I'm going to make a statement. The Holy Spirit will not bear witness with either of the first two spirits we talked about. The Holy Spirit will not bear witness with the fallen tear spirit. The Holy Spirit will not bear witness with the Adamic spirit. You say, how do you know? Because in the case of the Adamic spirit, it has to be born again before the Holy Spirit okay. will deal with it. The Holy Spirit will deal with the Prototokos spirit because the Prototokos spirit is the son of God. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are, we are, we are the children of God from eternity. Now, why will he bear witness with us? The scripture tells us consistently that this group is favored by the Holy Spirit. Turn to the Gospel of John, 17th chapter, verse 5 to 6. John 17, verse 5 to 6. <clears throat> And now, O oh Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. The protostokas belonged to the Lord before they incarnated into this world. They were always connected to the Father. The other two spirits weren't. Concerning the tear spirits, they'll never be connected to the Father. Concerning the Adamic spirits, they never have been connected to the Father. 
It will only be connected to the Father at the time when all this passes away. Turn to Revelation 21st chapter. Verse 2 to 5. <clears throat> I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God, the Father, is with men. The Adamic race. First time since they were created, the tabernacle of God is now with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Prior to this, the only dealings that have been with the Adamic race has been through the Son. Arrangements are made that they could stay in connection with the Son. There was a pre-relationship with the Adamic spirits and the Son. Turn to Jeremiah first chapter verse 4 to 5. We see relationship established before the, the human birth. Jeremiah, first chapter, verse 4 to 5. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, Jeremiah, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. The word knew there comes from a word meaning intimate relationship. This is a word that's used when a man uh, has an intimate relationship with his wife. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. I had a relationship with you. And before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee, ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So we find that many of the Israelite prophets, uh, Adamic spirits that had a prior relationship with the Lord in eternity. Talking about the Son, Elohim the Son. In eternity. In eternity. In eternity, yes. <clears throat> well, you see in Genesis, he's speaking to them after he creates them, not made you custodians over the earth, this, 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 and this. He have given you every tree that get fruit, uh, given you dominion over all the land. It's into your hands. That's God the Son speaking to his creation. In eternity, but after the predestination. No. In the new earth, after the reconstruction or the creation okay. of the new heavens and the new mean. earth, okay. that's where man was created. Yes. I yeah. immediately go, yeah, as far back as I can. <laughs> I get it. Right. I'm being slow today. Forget no problem. No problem. Uh, <clears throat> turn to Psalms 139, 16. <clears throat> Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect, David, talking about his pre-existence, and in thy book all my, in my book all were written, <clears throat> in continuance, were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So David is talking about his relationship with Elohim. He said, how do you know he had a relationship with him? Because Elohim showed him his book. 
and he saw in the book everything was written about him. So Elohim creates David out of the Adamic race and he selects those that he has an intimate relationship with which in this life one will become Jeremiah, one will become David, one will be a prophet, one will be a king. They have a relationship with him. <clears throat> They're doing things together with us. That's what God does with his creation. So he's teaching them all the way back then. Sure. They wouldn't know how to ask for a book, so he clearly is showing them these things. Well, they, they, they have understanding. It's, it's not like you're sitting down talking instantaneously. You're getting understanding something. from the spiritual contact. Hmm. So he has understanding about the book and what's in the book. It pertains to him, everything he has done, everything he will do. In the book, <clears throat> he's going to be a king. In the book, it's not showing him everything, sure. but it's giving him understanding. So in this life, that's why God, the son, chose David to be the king. And tells YHVH, puts YHVH there to develop David in the king's position. YHVH stations angel to protect David because he's going to be, his life is made miserable, miserable by Saul. So there's a verse, I can't remember where I read it, which says that YHVH chose Saul. That was a mistake. From what I'm hearing from you now, the implication is that YHVH doesn't have the degree of intimacy at that time in the um, new earth mm -hmm. with Saul that YHVH, excuse me, that uh, Elohim does with David. No, he can't. And that's the reason why YHVH can't discern you know, well enough to pick the right man. In yes, yes. Well, YHVH uses his own <coughs> knowledge, wisdom, ingenuity to make his own decisions. Mm -hmm instead of depending upon the spirit of Elohim to guide him in making decisions like everybody else does. Every son that's going to be an overcomer is an overcomer for one reason, whether it's man or an angel, they submit themselves to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So we're learning that if White Reach had done exactly what you'd said, he would have access to the Holy Spirit, not in him, but access yes, to the Holy Spirit. Sure. And sure, then Holy everything Spirit. he did would make sense. Exactly. The Holy Spirit would be right there to help him and guide him. Yeah. Why not? Why wouldn't he? Yes. Okay. There was a bunch of questions I wanted to ask, but you guys went way past it. I'm not going to try to bring it back up. But what I will ask you this, Mr. Jones, is that <clears throat> does YHBH have the rights, the relationship with the Holy Spirit that he can approach the Holy Spirit for correction? Or is it just the Father, just Elohim? No, just Elohim. Uh, the Son. Okay, the son. so now, most of what we've been reading <coughs> has been Jesus. Yes. Okay. Right. <clears throat> because the Son has been given authority over us, over all things, to bring forth the Father's master plan. That's why he says, pertaining to the prototypes. They belong to you in eternity, but you gave them to me. And you gave them to me to develop. <coughs> Which is what he's doing. So just to reiterate, in verse 15, when okay. David is saying, um, my substance was not here for him. He's talking to Elohim, not Y3H. Yes, Elohim, totally. Yes, well, I don't know if Now, Scripture strongly infers to continue their relationship in this life. They would be incorporated into the reality of Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God. That's how they kept in contact, communication in this life with Elohim. Genesis 14, verse 18.
And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him. Uh, 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 Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham, Abram, of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. So Abraham had a relationship with Melchizedek. I believe that all the rest of them had a relationship with Melchizedek, Job, David, right. all the greats. Mm -hmm. Because that's the only way you could stay in connection. You, uh, the Hebrews talks about an everlasting priesthood. It's the same way we stay connected. We are part of an everlasting priesthood. We're priests. The Lord is the high priest. You have a priesthood. We get the fullness of our priesthood in eternity. We are priests. They stayed connected to priests so that they could stay connected to Elohim. Yes. When we do as Richard just now said, we step, we have to step into eternity, mm -hmm. and we are priests. Mm -hmm. Are we the most high priests? We're priests of the Most, the most high. high. Jesus is high priest yes. of the Most High. Okay. We have an everlasting priesthood, which we're connected to. They have an everlasting priesthood. So in eternity, they're still going to be connected to Melchizedek. Why? Because they cannot ascend into the heavens. They will always be on the earth. But they will have an eternal relationship with Elohim, unlike everybody else through the Melchizedek priesthood. You read about that in Hebrews. Mm. He says, I make you, Jesus, a priest like the priesthood of Melchizedek, which is an everlasting priesthood. The reason it's everlasting is because he'll always be the priest of the old covenant greats. Right. Should we understand, therefore, that John the Baptist being the last prophet of the Old Testament mm -hmm. had a relationship with <coughs> excuse me, had a relationship with Melchizedek. I believe... Uh, Hang on. And mm. if that's true, which at this point I believe that's true, Jesus Christ was also walking the earth at the same time. This, uh, John the Baptist was a transition. Being Great. the last figure. Mm -hmm. His relationship was with Christ. And not with, not with Melchizedek, Melchizedek. Even though he represented the last phase of the Old Testament. Yeah, because he had to transition into the New Covenant okay. to be able to be the bridge Between for the Jesus to establish his ministry. When's the last time we see Melchizedek in the Old Testament? Well, the last time you hear about him is uh, here in, uh, uh, in Genesis. Genesis. Okay. But they talk about him, of course, in Hebrews sure. and allude to him. Yes. So he brings up John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. It is said of him, of men who were born of a woman, none greater than John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. So it just, it's interesting how he's not a priest, but he has the highest rank access to Melchizedek. John the Baptist. John, John the Baptist is a priest. Yeah. He is a priest. Yeah. Yep. Well, he's, he's basically, his job is not dealing with Melchizedek because Melchizedek is confined to the old covenant right, saints. Right. His job is to transition people to Christ. Mm -hmm. Focus them away from Melchizedek onto Christ. the Lord, which has a higher covenant than the Melchizedek order does. So he's the, the herald of the Lord. Yes. To, you know, to the Old Testament. Yes, well, not fact, just to the Old Testament saints, to the, to the New Testament saints yes. as well. That's why his whole ministry was baptizing people to prepare them for the coming of the Messiah. Right. And in that respect, <clears throat> he carried out his job um, to the T. The, uh, the problem is they didn't really understand John the Baptist mm. and what his place was because of the scribes and the Pharisees sure. throwing a monkey wrench in anywhere they could. But what we find here, they have a cemented relationship 
with Melchizedek that is based off of the Abrahamic covenant established by Elohim, the son. With that, in other words, when you see Abraham speaking, matter of fact, turn over to Genesis, I believe it's 20. Just bear with me a moment. Fifteen. Fifteen, fifteen, or fifteen, fourteen, fifteen. No, um, Genesis fifteen, verse starting verse nine. Whenever you see it started with, after these things, the word of the Lord came into Abram, that's Elohim. He said unto him, Take thee an heifer of three years old, a she goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all of these, and he divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against the other, one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, in horror, a great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Over certainty that thy seed, which shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. So he's talking about captivity in Egypt. Also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, Egypt. Afterward they shall come out with great substance. Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. And he talks to them about coming back and what they're going to do. And in that respect, it talks about... Okay. Verse 5 and 6. This cements the covenant. He brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. He said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted to him for righteousness. That sealed the Abrahamic covenant. It's a covenant of faith. And the other parts of the promises that go into the covenant pertaining to his descendants. <clears throat> Everybody that had a relationship with Melchizedek also entered into the Abrahamic covenant, faith covenant. And in that respect, that sealed their position in eternity. As a result, a million years from now, they will be connected to Elohim by the Abrahamic covenant and the Melchizedek priesthood. They'll never be able to ascend beyond the earth matrix into the heavens but the knowledge of the things of the heavens will come down to them through their relationship with El he commune with them matter of fact he's going to be on the earth anyway uh, the father will be with them on the earth communing with them and but they'll still 
B, participating in the Abrahamic covenant in the Melchizedek priesthood because they cannot come directly into the Father's presence. They're not sons, they're servants. But this is a provision that the Father has made for them for eternity. We, on the other hand, are preparing for something greater. As adopted sons, we will experience the fullness of sonship. Absolutely. Not through a priesthood, but as priests. And when we understand what the scripture is saying, what is giving us the authority and everything else, it's inspiring us to look at the highest that we could possibly conceive. We can't conceive of it all, but what we can conceive is enough to give us a grandiose perspective of all things as sons. <laughs>